Russia begins occupying Severodonets and Barajas Ukraine from the north and south from the skies above Belarus to the north and the waters of the Black Sea to the south. Russian forces unleashed a fusillade of cruise missiles across Ukraine on Saturday, Ukrainian officials said, in one of the most widespread and coordinated aerial assaults in weeks. Even as Russia pounded civilian and military infrastructure from the air, fierce fighting raged on the Eastern Front, where Russian forces pressed to cut off the supply lines for thousands of Ukrainian soldiers. Maps. Tracking the Russian invasion of Ukraine Russian forces launched a large-scale missile attack across Ukraine. The Ukrainian military said that Russian warplanes had attacked Ukrainian positions near the eastern city of Lysykansk, the last urban stronghold still under Ukrainian control in the eastern Luhansk province, as Russian forces pressed to encircle the city. On Saturday, Mayor Alexander Stryak said that Russian forces now occupied his city, Severodonets, where Ukrainian and Russian forces had fought for weeks across the river from Lysykansk. Ukrainian forces withdrew this week from the city to the other side of the Siversky Donets River, where they have higher ground and fortified positions in Lysykansk. The missile strikes on Saturday came hours before President Vladimir V. Putin of Russia met with President Alexander G. Lukashenko of Belarus in St. Petersburg. Belarusian forces were also once again conducting military drills near the border with the Kyiv region, in Ukraine's north, raising tensions and putting the authorities there on high alert. Ukraine's military intelligence agency called the Russian assault, a large-scale provocation of Russia for the purpose of further dragging Belarus into the war against Ukraine. Western military analysts say it is unlikely that Belarus would join the Russian war effort, but Mr. Lukashenko's hold on power is dependent on the Kremlin's support, limiting his room for political maneuver. President Biden was traveling on Saturday to Germany, where he would join the leaders of the world's wealthiest democracies known as the Group of Seven, to bolster Western resolve in supporting Ukraine in the face of the growing economic toll the war is taking on their nations. Even as Ukraine faces perhaps its toughest moment on the battlefield since the early weeks of the war, the commander of its military, General Valery Zaluzhny, released a slickly produced video to celebrate the first battlefield use of advanced multiple launch rocket systems from the United States. He said the weapons were being used to hit, military targets of the enemy on our, Ukrainian, territory. But the Russian missile strikes offered a potent reminder of the vast destructive power of the arsenal at Moscow's disposal, which has been directed both at military targets and at civilian areas of cities and towns. The mayor of the embattled southern port city of Mykolaiv, which has been under attack from Russian forces since the start of the war, called for, everyone who wants to survive, to leave, because, it's not clear when all this will be over. Speaking in an interview with Radio Liberty, he said that the city was being shelled daily, and that, around 80% of those munitions are cluster munitions, fired from Russian multiple launch rocket systems. Already, about half of Mykolaiv's pre-war population of 480,000 have fled. Among those remaining, Many are older, and about 80% of them survive on food and clothes distributed by aid organizations. The Russian strikes on Saturday also hit areas of the country that have been relatively quiet in recent weeks. Even in western and northern regions, where the wail of air alarms had become more sporadic, they rang out numerous times in less than 48 hours to signal that missiles had been fired within striking distance. Dozens of the missile strikes were launched by Russian aircraft in Belarusian airspace overnight, according to a Belarusian monitoring group, Belarusian Gyan, which has been detailing Russian actions since the start of the war. Better understand the Russia-Ukraine war history and background, here's what to know about Russia and Ukraine's relationship and the causes of the conflict. How the battle is unfolding. Russian and Ukrainian forces are using a bevy of weapons as a deadly war of attrition grinds on in eastern Ukraine. The mayor of Mykolaiv, the embattled southern Ukrainian city, urges all residents to leave. Mykolaiv, Ukraine, the mayor of this embattled southern port city, under attack from Russian forces since the start of the war, has called for, everyone who wants to survive, to leave, because, it's not clear when all this will be over. The mayor, Alexander Senkevich, said in an interview with Radio Liberty that the city was being shelled daily, and that, around 80% of those munitions are cluster munitions, fired from Russian multiple launch rocket systems. 
A large exodus from Mykolaiv, once a major hub of Soviet shipbuilding, has already occurred. About 230,000 people remain in the city, less than half of its peacetime population of 480,000. Many are older, and about 80% of them survive on food and clothes distributed by aid organizations. The strategic importance of the city is pivotal. Almost overrun in the first weeks of fighting, Mykolaiv's defenders have pushed Russian forces back to a distance of at least 20 miles at their closest point. Still, the Russian army is close enough to inflict casualties and damage at will with missiles and artillery. The mayor's statement was somewhat surprising, in that the combative, never-say-die spirit of Mykolaiv has become a symbol of Ukrainian resistance. The city is calmer than in March, when the bombardment was relentless. Departures have slowed to a trickle. Among those remaining in Mykolaiv are tens of thousands of people who have already moved once, from surrounding villages either taken or immediately threatened by Russian forces. Vitaly Kim, the head of the regional military administration, has become something of a national idol through his consistent bravura in video and other messages, calling the Russian army, stupid, among other dismissive remarks. Mykolaiv stands between the Russian invading force in Odessa, Ukraine's largest maritime city 70 miles to the west. A landlocked Ukraine deprived of access to the Black Sea, the conduit for much of its grain and other exports, would be a seriously compromised power. President Vladimir V Putin of Russia has made no secret of coveting Odessa, founded by a Russian empress, as part of his own imperial plans. Shelling is from the Kherson region, the mayor said in the Radio Liberty interview, alluding to the city about 40 miles to the east that Russian forces captured early in the war. That's why it's impossible to switch on the siren in advance. The shells explode in the city and then the siren goes. He added that, highly precise, cruise missiles had ruined the city's infrastructure. Mayors in other parts of Ukraine have advised residents not actively involved in the resistance effort to leave cities under attack. But Mr. Senkevich's request appeared more sweeping. The interview was published on Friday, but it was not clear when it was conducted. At least 111 civilians have been killed in Mykolaiv since late February. Military casualties are not known. One Russian missile hit a residential area of Mykolaiv a little over a week ago, killing one person and injuring 20. Another on Wednesday hit grain and vegetable oil terminals at the port. At the same time, however, Ukrainian forces have counterattacked in the Kherson area. They say they have recaptured some villages. In a separate interview this week with the New York Times, Mr. Senkevich, 40, said he expected the war to go on, at least until April or May next year. He described the people still in the city as older people, ready to die here, comparing them, in a seemingly odd analogy, to pharaohs, who do not want to leave their pyramids. Evacuations had been running at four to eight buses a day early in the war, but were now down to one or two a week, the mayor said. There was no suggestion in the Times interview that the mayor, whose own wife and two children left Mykolaiv within, 2.5 hours of the first bombardment, thought that anyone wanting to survive should leave. Mr. Senkevich said in that interview that he had received messages from Russian forces urging him to surrender. Mayor, you have to give up, you don't want to end up like Mariupol, one of these messages said, a reference to the Ukrainian city on the Sea of Azov that Russia besieged, flattened and ultimately captured. They think the mayor can decide to surrender, he said dismissively. Mark Santora contributed reporting from Warsaw. Putin met today with Belarus's leader, a longtime ally. Analysts say Alexander G. Lukashenko, an autocrat beholden to Russia, is desperately trying to show his value to President Vladimir V. Putin. Credit, Marcus Schreiber, Associated Press. In the weeks before Russia invaded Ukraine, it held joint military drills with its neighbor and ally Belarus, massing tens of thousands of soldiers along the Ukrainian border even as the two countries' leaders denied reports that the Kremlin was planning to go to war. On Saturday, President Vladimir V. Putin of Russia met President Alexander G. Lukashenko of Belarus in St. Petersburg, promising weapons capable of holding nuclear warheads which Mr. Lukashenko, dubbed, Europe's last dictator, said would make his country, ready for anything. 
Mr. Putin promised to deliver the Iskander M systems, which have a range of about 300 miles and can carry both conventional and nuclear warheads, within months, and also vowed to upgrade Belarusian Su-25 fighter jets, after Mr. Lukashenko asked the Russian leader to make its warplanes capable of carrying nuclear weapons. We need to be ready for anything, even the use of serious weaponry to defend our fatherland from Brest to Vladivostok, Mr. Lukashenko said, referring to Belarus' westernmost city and Russia's port in the Far East. While the men met, the Belarusian armed forces were once again holding mobilization, drills in the area bordering Kyiv, the Ukrainian capital, threatening to aggravate tensions in an already volatile region and prompting Ukraine to put its border guards on high alert. Units are being brought to higher levels of combat readiness, practical measures are being taken to accept conscripts, weapons and military equipment are being removed from storage, a spokesman for the Ukrainian military's operational command said in a statement this month. Ukrainian officials and Western observers think it is highly unlikely that Belarus, a former Soviet republic of 9.4 million people, will directly join the war at this time, given the risks of provoking social unrest at home and undermining Mr. Lukashenko's grip on power. Morale among Belarusian troops has also been shaky, according to Pavel P. Latishko, a former senior Belarusian official who fled the country. Nevertheless, analysts believe Mr. Lukashenko, an autocrat beholden to the Kremlin, is desperately trying to show his value to Mr. Putin. He has proved a dependable friend ever since Mr. Putin bolstered his security forces to help him put down mass protests that followed an implausible landslide victory in a contested presidential election in 2020. The former director of a Soviet collective pig farm, Mr. Lukashenko has secured his hold on Belarus over nearly three decades by maneuvering adroitly between East and West, playing each side against the other. But in the aftermath of last year's uprising against him, he has become increasingly dependent on the Kremlin and docile to Mr. Putin. Some analysts believe it is only a matter of time before pressure from Mr. Putin forces Mr. Lukashenko to take more direct action in the war, pushing him into an existential dilemma. Joining the conflict could undermine his support at home, but if he does not do Mr. Putin's bidding, the Russian leader could retaliate by taking steps to force him from office. In the early stages of the war, Belarus allowed Mr. Putin to use its territory for Russian troops to stage a shock and awe operation to try to capture Kyiv. The plan failed spectacularly, but with Russia now bogged down in a grinding war of attrition in Ukraine's east, Moscow would benefit from any help Mr. Lukashenko could provide. Mr. Lukashenko has proved himself a pliant friend. He has used Belarus's 600-mile border with Ukraine to help place wooden, dummy tanks, in the woods, creating the illusion of impending danger. To replenish Russia's arsenal, and to allow Moscow to stage missile strikes from within Belarusian territory. As part of this weekend's drills, the Belarusian army has dispatched 3,500 to 4,000 military personnel near the border, according to Alexander Matuzianik, a spokesman for Ukraine's defense ministry. The entire Belarusian army has about 60,000 troops, he said, although Mr. Lukashenko wants to add another 20,000. The Belarusian Defense Ministry said its special operation forces would participate in the drills, which will take place in the country's southeastern Gomel region, whose border is just 65 miles from Kyiv. While Mr. Lukashenko has made it clear that his loyalties now rest firmly with Mr. Putin, he remains a mercurial leader, known for sometimes unpredictable behavior. Among other things, he has touted ice hockey, vodka, saunas and tractor driving as remedies for COVID, sent a fighter jet to intercept a European airliner carrying a prominent dissident, and made his general salute his teenage son. Amid a break from the war, a couple in Kyiv take 11 minutes to get married. The war in Ukraine has interrupted a lot in the lives of Alexander, 23, and Kristina, 22. But it didn't stop their wedding on Saturday morning in Kyiv. The couple, who asked not to be further identified for their personal safety, walked down the aisle of an empty wedding hall and exchanged rings without many guests. We had only several hours to organize it, Alexander said. Our relatives are either in different parts of Ukraine or abroad as refugees. Alexander, who is from Kiev and earlier worked as a confectioner in Buga, joined Ukraine's nationalist Azov Battalion when he was 18.
Christina worked as a hairdresser for many years before the war began. She wanted to join the fight in Ukraine, but Alexander didn't want her to be in danger. We really wanted to become a family from the first day we met each other, she said. The wedding ceremony started at 11 sharp. There was a brief photo session before the couple walked quickly into the ceremony hall for the official moment. Afterward, shyly, they watched the video made for them by the wedding hall's official cameraman. Then Alexander paid for the ceremony while Christina held her bouquet of flowers. Eleven minutes after new tensions erupt over Kaliningrad, Russia's isolated, westernmost region on the Baltic Sea. KYBARTAI, Lithuania, as war rages in Ukraine, fueling ever-growing tensions between NATO and Russia, a sleepy Baltic railway station with no passengers and few trains this week found itself at the center of a perilous new confrontation between East and West. The station stands on the border between Lithuania, a NATO member and strong supporter of Ukraine, and Kaliningrad, a Russian exclave on the Baltic Sea stuffed with nuclear-capable missiles but physically disconnected from the rest of Russia. From the Lithuanian town of Kaibartai, decked with Ukrainian flags, the railway tracks extend west into Kaliningrad, bringing goods into the region, but also tracing a potentially volatile strategic fault line on the edges of Europe. This week, long dormant tensions over Kaliningrad erupted, further fraying Russia's relations with the West, after unfounded claims by Moscow that Europe was choking off train and trucking routes bringing vital supplies to Kaliningrad, and would, as a result, face retaliation. Russia will certainly respond to such hostile action, Nikolai P. Petrushev, the head of the Kremlin's Security Council and one of President Vladimir V. Putin's closest advisors, warned Tuesday during a visit to Kaliningrad. He said that Russia would take measures, in the near future, that, will have a serious negative impact on the population of Lithuania. The threat set off a frantic scramble by Washington and in European capitals to head off something they have sought to avoid since Mr. Putin invaded Ukraine four months ago, a direct confrontation between Russia and NATO. On Wednesday, Lithuanian ministers and legislators gathered in a secure underground conference room to game out possible Russian responses and discuss how the dry minutia of European sanctions had set off a rush of unintended and possibly dangerous consequences. Nobody wanted or expected any of this, said Lorinas Kashunas, chairman of Lithuania's Defense and Security Committee, who led the meeting. We all know how sensitive Kaliningrad is for the Russians.